take some long, deep in and out breaths. Have the sense that the breath is sweeping through your whole body, from the top of the head down to the tips of your toes. Try to notice whether there are any patterns of tension in the body. Allow them to relax. Let the breath sweep right through them. And then allow the breath to find a rhythm that feels really comfortable. You can experiment for a while to see what kind of breathing feels most refreshing. Sometimes sh shorter breathing is what the body needs, sometimes, sometimes longer, sometimes deeper, more shallow. Heavier, lighter, faster, or slower. Try to keep on top of what the body needs. As for any other thoughts that may come in, just let them go. Trying to sensitize ourselves to what's going on in the body. And how the breath can help. It's an area of our awareness that we tend to ignore because we're too interested with things outside. And we ignore what we're doing inside. When they talk about things being unconscious or subconscious, it's not so much that we have a basement in the mind where things have to be unconscious. It's simply we're not paying attention. Thoughts go flitting through the mind and then they leave an imprint on the body. Where events in the body can have an impact on the mind. And all too often, if we're not aware of this, the tension builds up and results in a sense of being burdened, being weighed down. And the Buddha's essential insight is a lot of that being burdened and weighed down is totally unnecessary. In fact, none of it is necessary. There may be stress in the body, but it doesn't have to have an impact on the mind. He talks about when people are in pain. If it's physical pain, it's as if they were shot by an arrow. And then they shoot themselves again with an arrow, another arrow, with a sorrow, or the sense of being burdened, or a sense of being victimized by the pain. Well, that image has always struck me as a little bit too weak. It's not just one extra arrow that we shoot ourselves with. We shoot ourselves with many more arrows. Of course, as we're shooting ourselves with those arrows, that makes the original pain even worse. To say nothing of all the pain of the extra arrows. And so no, no wonder we're burdened all the time. No wonder we feel victimized. Or at the very least, that something is wrong. And so what we're doing as we meditate is instead of looking for the answer outside, we look for the answer inside. What are we doing here that's adding all that unnecessary pain? Now this is not being selfish, because if you find that you can stop adding that extra pain to your own mind, you're less burdened and you can actually start paying attention to other people how they're doing. We tend to forget this part of the practice, but meditators are really good friends to have, because they've learned that they don't have to weigh themselves down all the time, and when they're not weighed down, they can actually be of more help. When pain comes along, whether it's physical or mental, they don't have to take it personally. There's a passage where the monks are talking. And one of them, a sorry Buddha, says, you know, I was thinking today, is there anything in the world whose change would cause me grief? And I couldn't think of anything at all. And Ananda, another one of the monks, said, well, what about if something happened to the Buddha? Wouldn't that cause you grief? And sorry Buddha said, no, I'd reflect on the fact that he was a great human being, he'd been very helpful to many. And it's a sad thing he couldn't live on, but I wouldn't feel any personal grief around that. And then they said, well, it's a sign that your, your conceit is gone. Conceit here meaning not necessarily pride or arrogance. It means more your sense of 
who you are and how you take things personally. And you find that if you can be in a difficult situation and not take the loss or not take the change personally, you're actually more helpful to others than you would be otherwise. I've seen many cases where people are crying over someone who's about to die. And a lot of the crying has to do with how much they're going to miss that person, how much grief they feel. That's not all that helpful to the person who's dying. The best gift you can give to someone else who is in trouble is that you've taken care of your habit of personalizing the grief, of focusing on how much you're going to feel the loss or how much you're going to feel deprived. And that allows you to look more carefully at, well, what does this person need? How can I genuinely be of help? We're talking today about helping someone who's dying. and The first thing the Buddha said is, try to make sure that that person is not worried. There are two cases in the canon. One is of a woman whose husband seems to be on his deathbed. And so she goes and tells him, don't worry about me. I'll be able to take care of myself when you're gone. Don't worry about my financial situation. Don't worry about my turning away from the Dharma. In fact, I'll be going to the monastery even more now. So put your mind at rest. And it turns out that the, the husband doesn't die, at least not then. He recovers. And he goes to tell the Buddha what his wife told him. And, he said, and the Buddha said, do you really ha realize how fortunate you are that you have such a wise wife who has your best interest in mind? And there's a similar case where one of the Buddha's cousins, Mahanama, learns that the Buddha is going to go away at the end of the rains retreat. So I asked him, if there's anybody who's dying while you're gone, what should I tell them? And the Buddha says, the first thing you tell them is to not worry about their, their families. That regardless of what the situation is, the fact that they're worried now is not going to help anybody. But it doesn't just leave him there. He says, are you worried also about the sensual pleasures you're going to be leaving. And if the person says yes, and the Buddha says, well, so try to set your mind on other levels of being where the sensual pleasures are more refined, where they're higher, and advises him to take his thoughts all the way through even higher and higher levels, just why he gets to the Brahma world, where the pleasure is the same pleasure that we gain from a really concentrated mind. And if the person can keep up, then Buddha says, okay, then tell him to let go even of that. That too is impermanent. The sense of identity you would build around that, that's impermanent. And the Buddha says, if the person can follow you all that way, then they can gain total release from all kinds of suffering. That's a huge gift you can give to someone who's dying. Now, it's not always the case that the person dying can follow you that far. It would require someone who's got a good meditative background. But your first duty always is to try to pull that person away from any worries, and then advise them to set their minds on something good. It could be the good things they have done in the past. And this doesn't mean the good times they've had, because that gets people sentimental and then that's great. That can get them really upset. No? Have them think about the times they were generous, the times they were virtuous. If they have any meditative background, try to remind them of that. Give them something good to hold on to. This means that you're not putting your sense of loss in the way of really helping them. And this is why having a meditator as a friend is a really good thing. someone who really is concerned with your welfare and is not only thinking of his or her own sense of loss or sense of pain, is not being burdened by those extra arrows. I know in my own case for a long time I 
a lot of people in my family wondered why, what good it was to have a monk in the family. And then one year my father went through a severe depression. I was away in Thailand and finally was able to make my way back this after several months. And within a couple of weeks after talking to my father and letting him talk, he was out of the depression. This is after my brothers had been trying for months to help him. That's when one of my brothers said, it really is good to have a Buddhist monk in the family. Of course, it doesn't have to be a monk. Anybody who's trained the mind, trained his or her own mind, is a good person to have in the family, is a good person to have as a friend. So as we're meditating here, remind, you, remind yourselves, it's not just for us that we're doing this. We're doing this so we can also be of help to others. The less we burden ourselves with our own sufferings, the stronger we'll be. If we're not carrying huge loads around, you find somebody else has got a heavy load, well, you can shoulder part of their burden. So the training and good friendship can continue. The Buddha says you try to look for good friends, people you can rely on. Not only so that you can gain their help, but also so you can learn from them what it means to be a good friend, so you can pass on the gift. <laughs>